Greetings from Austin, Texas. My name is Victoria Di Francesco Soto, and I am the Assistant Dean for Civic Engagement at the LBJ School. This year, we turn 50. 50 years of training policymakers and engaging with stakeholders. In order to commemorate our 50th anniversary, we launched the In the Arena series. Today, as we get into the arena, we are looking at one of the most pressing issues of our time, policing. The murder of Mr. George Floyd earlier this summer trained the spotlight on the issue of policing, but the larger infrastructure of structural racism. This system has seen the loss of countless lives. This isn't at something that happened this summer or has been happening over the last couple of years. This has been happening historically to our black and brown communities. The question is, the question for those in the arena, for our policymakers, for our advocates is, how do we move forward? How do we design and how do we implement policing strategies that keep all of us safe and secure? To dig into these questions, I am joined by two individuals at the forefront of engaging on this issue of policing. With me today, I have the honor and pleasure of being joined by Mimi Stiles, who is the president and the founder of the award-winning nonprofit organization measure based here out of Austin, a public education and advocacy organization that empowers people and the organizations to use data to tell their own story and also mobilizing communities to address systemic disparities in a wide range of issues from policing, health, economics, and education. We also have with us today, Dr. Gordon Abner. Dr. Abner is a professor here at the LBJ School, a good friend of mine, where Gordon has a focus generally on the design and implementation of policy within the public sector. And today he will be focusing on some of his recent research on the role of police accreditation. To first frame the issue of of policing and public safety though, however, we're gonna start with Mrs. Stiles. So Mrs. Stiles is going to give us a big picture overview based on uh, the multitude of research her organization has done. And then we're going to pivot over to Dr. Abner who will dig in and focus on his research in particular. We'll then zoom out and I'll be able to engage with them in what they have been working on and seeing both here at the local level and nationally and as always, we will finish off with an engagement of you all in the Q&A. So please, please, please make sure to drop your questions into the Q&A function. And I'm gonna leave the last portion of this hour in order to hear from you and engage directly with Dr. Abner and Mimi Stiles. So without further ado, let me hand it off to you, Mimi, and thank you once again for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I can't help but smile when you talk about measure just because of the fact that there are so many amazing volunteers um, in Austin and, you know, just honestly all around the country now that's engaging in this work to really unpack um, and undo, um, you know, the issues that we're seeing today, institutionalized racism, understanding the whys behind you know, why we, the, why we do what we do, why do we see these different statistics and applying lived experience. So I really appreciate it. Um, to, to the topic, so more and more, you know, our country each day is realizing that we have to go way beyond it, law enforcement and our basic understanding in order to, under, in, to, in order to really adequately define public safety um, is, is really at stake. And so we're coming face to face that with the notion that public safety is like, it's something more, right, Victoria? It's something mm -hmm. that happens by the people, for the people. It's based in partnership between the public um, and institutions um, as mutual stakeholders and really maintaining a safe and functional, non-threatening, healing community. And so when we also when we you know also understand that we have to move fast 
fast right now. We have to move fast in order to redefine and really reallocate budgets in order to fund this new frontier of public safety, but why, right? So if you wanna go ahead and bring up that first slide, I'll share just really a tip of the mountain of what my organization is really invested, why rather, you know, we're really invested in divestment <laughs> in a smart, reasonable, evidence-based way when trying to understand um, public safety. And so on this first, on this first um, you know, icon here, you'll see roots. So while Colonial Boston in particular started one of the first formal night watchmen in 1636, we have to recognize that in the South, the creation and the roots, the roots of police forces were centered mm -hmm. in the preservation of the enslavement of Black bodies. Mm -hmm. So in order to really understand the history of public safety, um, currently as we know it, um, it, in most parts is like policing, right? Or if you ask some folks at the top, they may say law and order. We have to first understand that the perverse and inhumane roots by which the system has actually blossomed and grown from. So to note that the slave patrols were for a very long time informal, right? But became a formal thing to capture runaway enslaved black bodies as early as 1704 um, in the Carolina colonies. And so that next, that next icon there is, is harm. So quite simply and proven by the numbers, which kind of wakes me up every single day, is that harm on the community has been and is petu perpetuated by the, um, the experimental framework of what we know as public safety today, law and order, right? We know that as of June 30th, 2020, um, over 500, 506 civilians have been shot, right? 105 have been, are black. We know that more people were shot in 2019 than there were in 2018. So we, so we can say that it's going up even more. We know that the rate of fatal police shootings among black people um, was, was much higher than any other ethnicity, you know, standing at 31 fatal shootings per million um, of the population as of June 2020. Um, in Austin, you know, you can get a lot of that data from, from like, from mapping police violence, and I'll talk a little bit about a couple of data sets in a minute. But in Austin, particularly, right here at home, we know that each and every person that was shot and killed last year was a person of color, right? Um, so when I challenge the notion of public safety, I really have to ask, you know, who are we trying to keep safe, right? Like, who are we trying to keep safe? Um, politics. So when the, the definition of public safety, this is one of my main reasons why we have got to redefine it, is because when the definition of public safety becomes political, we lose out on progress. Completely. The left and the right are completely on polar opposite sides in their understanding of the problem. Um, you know, last year a study by Pew found that white Democrats and white Republicans have totally different views of how black people are treated by the police. There were almost 88% of white Democrats said black people um, were treated less fairly than whites by police as opposed to white um, Republicans who, it was 43% who agreed with that same statement. So, so we know that, you know, because it's been left in the hands of, of politics, of politicians, the experiment has completely failed, right? Um, another reason why the experiment has completely failed. So when blue comes in, we may get a few bones of equity thrown our way. You know, we saw some progress under the Obama administration, but then when red comes in, we take leaps and bounds backwards. And that's been a, an incredible challenge, um, especially in the work that we do at Measure. And so uh, moving on to bad data, right? So you know, the number of, again, unarmed men fatally shot by police is likely higher than what most 
of the data um, sets that are reporting due to a lack of comprehensive police reports. We know that the FBI's reporting system does not gather um, data from every single one of the law enforcement agencies or some folks that are not in compliance, right? So plus it's hard for, it's hard for data activists like myself or for my team um, uh, to, to really truly understand the depths of the problems of public safety because Again, we need disaggregated data. We, and, and when we talk about disaggregated data, we need disaggregated data by gender, by sexual orientation. We have a lot of people that are being left out of the conversation. And of course, by race. Um, and I, I told you a minute ago that I would share a couple of the data sources that Measure likes to use. Um, first and foremost, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we believe in lived experience as data. Right, so going directly to the people to ask, what is their, how do they feel? What are they experiencing? And we use that as evidence, as it should be, right? Um, also, some of my very favorite data sets are mapping police violence. If you have not gone to that site, please do. It's phenomenal, it's brilliant. The Washington Post, of course, although they do have limited data, sometimes they don't report. I mean, a lot of their data is, is captured by like social media or different reports like that. So it is limited, but it's one of the it's one of the go to sources. Um, one of my very favorite local is the Texas Justice Initiative. Um, and then just, you know, people in general, organizations in general are becoming much more data driven, which I'm really excited about. I mean, I started talking about data back in 2000. 15 um, when data was not sexy right i was talking about data and policing and no and, you know it just wasn't a thing but now it's becoming a thing so that's that's important um this other this other icon of why public safety it's so important for us to right now redefine it is because of the toll of mental health and i'm very clear and honest about my own experience um, with this right like i have three brothers that all experience and live with schizophrenia, which is very unique in one family. And so this is something that I understand from a very personal place. Um, and so persons experiencing a mental health crisis can, can quickly find themselves interacting with, with police that can ultimately result in their death. That's a fact. Um, Austin, uh, again, to be very local, is the fourth in the country for the rate of people killed by police with a known mental illness and has the highest rate among the largest 15 cities. Now, this was data between 2013 and 2019 that showed us that 41 percent of the people killed by police had a known mental illness in Austin, which is over twice the national average. Um, and that national average is, you know, 19 percent. Um, so that's incredibly problematic. And so when we think about, you know, solutions, we have to think about how do we fix that, right? And so, um, and then lastly, bad measures. So aligning the community's goals of measurable outcomes that they're seeking to create this new, um, this new normal of public safety is actually going to be impossible without, and please hear me when I say this, without a radical overhaul um, to the current performance measures captured by most police departments, okay? Radical overhaul. So locally, let's bring it back home, on June 11th, there were goals, um, goals provided by the city of Austin's Resolution 50 called for a dramatically different approach to public safety than the current operations at APD. Um, you know, since the goals in Resolution 50, they were actually centered in um, and around eradicating racial disparity um, in, you know, in, 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 in citations, and uh, they said that they wanted to completely um, uh, zero out uh, police shooting or killings by police and by 2023. Um, wanted zero disparities in citations and arrests by 2023. I mean, these are huge goals. I mean, tell me goals like that, I quickly think about metrics, right? And so, of course, I went and looked at APD's metrics um, again, <laughs> as I frequently do, and saw that um, the metrics captured by APD, you know, they, they completely do not at all align with this goals, with those goals that the city has set, and honestly, with the goals that the that the world is setting right now. Um, and so we have to have a dramatic overhaul with how we're measuring 
um, these, you know, public safety. And so if you want to go ahead, I'll wrap up and I'm going to show you all what, how we define public safety um, as I kind of wrap this up. And so this is, again, this is our, you know, measure has to have a framework by which to work with, right? Like in order to understand, like, and how do we, how are we viewing our world at measure? How are we, um, how are we advocating and how are we showing up when it's time to go um, speak up at City Hall? And so for us, measure defines public safety as a radical systems approach to the protection of life, health, and property whereby a system is a unit and i think about it like a computer i'm such a tech geek sometimes but i think about it like a computer so we're, it's totally dependent on each component resulting in the complete elimination or obviation of danger to the public and it also results in the restorative community healing required in order to do in order to undo rather institutionalized racism and so to us, to me, um, as we go about this work and as we talk about public safety, as we talk about who are we including in this system of public safety, who are we not including in the systems of public safety, we have to understand that public safety is dependent upon several different systems of systems. And so I hope that helps to really frame this conversation um, in our understanding of, um, of this topic. And I can't wait to hear what Gordon has to add to, to it too. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, quickly, you are in very good company when it comes to thinking that data is sexy and being a big nerd. So here at the LVJ School, we are right there with you. Uh, just really quickly, thank you for that holistic framing with the historical precedent, precedent as well. And whenever we approach a public policy issue, whatever it is, we need to have a complete framework to work with. So I think this is a, a perfect jumping off point for Gordon for your work on police accreditation. And I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. All right, so that was a great segue because I think it's important, like uh, Vicki noted and Mimi noted, that uh, policing accreditation is just one mechanism. There are lots of mechanisms that are going to need to be in place in order to hold uh, police officers accountable and to keep them safe. And so I just want to make note of the fact that policing accreditation is just one component. There's lots of things that are going to be necessary in order to uh, achieve the outcomes that we want. But for the past two years, a group of wonderful collaborators and I have been conducting research on police accreditation. Um, and if you've heard about police accreditation, you may have heard about it uh, following the killing of Michael Brown. Michael Brown was shot and killed by a police officer in 2014. Uh, and there were a number of protests that followed his killing. Uh, in 2015, Governor Jay Nixon, the governor of Missouri, signed a law saying that all 58 police departments within St. Louis County had to become accredited within six years and they could be either accredited by the state accreditation body or by the national accrediting body. And so there's one national accrediting body. This is the accrediting body that we researched for uh, that we conducted interviews regarding for our research and that national accrediting body is CALEA. It's the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies and CALEA was founded in 1979 and in 1984, uh, the first uh, police department was accredited. Uh, and CLIA was founded through the joint efforts of several really important law enforcement organizations, International Association of Chiefs of Police, National Organization for Black Law Enforcement Executives, the National Sheriff's Association, and the Police uh, Executive Research Forum. And one thing to note, as I said, uh, CLIA was founded in 1979 and it kind of followed uh, a lot of the urban unrest that happened in the 1960s, police departments that were in a situation not unlike we are today, where they said, well, what we're doing clearly isn't working. And so let's come to the table and think of something new. Uh, and so Kalia was born out of that, um, I, in many ways, humility, realizing that what was going on wasn't working. There are, Kalia is made up of a commission of 21 persons. 11 of those persons are 
law enforcement uh, practitioners, and 10 of them are people just working in the government and private sector. Some of them are politicians, some of them are corporate executives. And CLIA has one goal, is to improve law enforcement uh, service by creating a national body of standards uh, by which law, uh, for law enforcement professionals. Only about 5% of police departments are currently accredited and that it, it's hovered around that number ever since. So the long and short there is that most police departments are not accredited, um, certainly not accredited uh, by the national accrediting body. Uh, so I'm gonna briefly talk about how accreditation works. So if a police department wants to become accredited, uh, nowadays they can go online, they can get an application form, they fill out that application form, and then CLIA sends them information uh, of 480 some odd standards that they have to abide by to come into accreditation. Uh, and so it takes them three years to come into compliance with accreditation because it requires them to really rethink and change around their policies and procedures. It may require them to get some new equipment, which I'll, I'll say now and I'll probably talk about a little bit later, but um, one thing that we heard from the interviews that was really important, uh, and it's a huge source of liability if police departments don't get it right, is uh, how they control their evidence room, right? And so in some cases, police departments needed to get a bigger evidence room or they needed to get a, a climate controlled evidence room or padlocks for their evidence room and stuff like that. So anyways, it's a, a very arduous process. Uh, once they have gotten everything into compliance, they then send that information to CALIA, and then CALIA looks over that documentation. If they have everything together, then they do an on-site assessment. For the on-site assessment, um, they speak with people up and down the chain of command in the police department. And also, importantly, they also have a public hearing. Um, and for that public hearing, people can come up and provide comments. They can provide comments uh, via email or they can provide comments over the phone. Um, so the community is involved, which is an important piece. And I know Mimi's uh, organization does a great job of that. Uh, eventually, well, not eventually, a couple months later, Kalia makes a decision. Um, and from there, each year, uh, the police departments have to maintain accreditation. And I'll talk a little bit about how, but one of the things I didn't mention here, but it's important, perhaps part of the reason police departments don't become accredited is it does cost money. So you have to pay the initial accreditation fee and you have to pay a fee each year to maintain accreditation. Uh, and then the fourth year, um, so each year, CALIA requires police departments to submit randomly submit proofs that they're following 25% of whatever the standards are for that year. And then from there, in the fourth year, there's an on-site visit. And so they have to pay a little bit more for the on-site visit than you do each year annually um, where the on-site visit doesn't occur. And I can clarify some of this if it, people need clarification in the question and answer session. There are a number of important features of accreditation that we found from these interviews. I'll just mention a couple of them here. I'll mention a couple of limitations and then we'll go back to opening things up. But uh, one of the key policies uh, that uh, accreditation requires, one of the key standards is anti-bias policing policies. And there are a number of them. But one of the things that I think is key, and it sort of links to what Mimi was saying, is that anytime a police officer stops uh, someone, um, they have to re record the gender, the race of the person, and whether their person is from their jurisdiction or not. And also whether they actually got a ticket or, or they got a warning. And so from there, by collecting these data, if police departments are doing what they're supposed to be doing, then they have proof that they are, there's no bias in policing because they have the data to prove that there's no bias in policing. If there is bias, then the data requirements uh, for accreditation allow them to find out where the bias is. So who, what officers are disproportionately stopping people from certain demographic groups? And so one thing that really was somewhat surprising to me through our interviews is that uh, police, op police officers, we talked to a lot of chiefs and, and things like that, they were really happy about these anti-bias po policing policies because they said, if we're doing something wrong, we have proof that, uh, or if we're not doing something wrong, we have proof that we're not doing something wrong, right? So this can protect them. All these things that we're suggesting, myself and Mimi, I, I think are really protecting police officers and protecting citizens. Um, next thing uh, I'll say briefly is uh, they have a system called Power DMS, um, and it's a document management system. And this is really key, and it does, might not, well, it might sound important to people on this call, but um, is that um, it allows police departments to, it stores police departments documentation regarding their general orders, uh, uh, keeps information regarding training so people can complete training on it. Um, and it also allows police departments to run a lot of reports. So the benefit there is that 
Um, if a police officer does something that is not according to policy, you can go on the computer and say, well, this person signed off on this policy, so they knew what the policy was and they still didn't uh, adhere to that policy. Or with training, um, you say, oh, well, this officer was not trained, or they were trained and they still didn't follow the training. And we have proof because officers have to log into the system and to verify that they are have received a document or that they've completed a training, they've taken a quiz on training and things like that. So once again, pointing to what Mimi was saying earlier, data, this is a data man uh, management system and it's really important, it's really the linchpin in my opinion uh, of this. Uh, I mentioned this before, but each year uh, CLIA requires police departments to provide proofs uh, they choose randomly of 25% of the standards that are required of the police department. And so uh, there are requirements about interacting with the community. And so the proof could be a pamphlet from a cooking, a cookout or something, or it could be a photo of uh, someone purchasing uh, body cameras or whatever it is. But it's not just them saying that they have these standards, but they actually have to provide proof that they're following them. And the last one uh, here that I'll mention, or the last, last two, uh, is a personnel early warning system. So this is another great feature and it's done through the Power DMS system. Uh, and basically, anytime officer gets a complaint, a sustained complaint or has a use of force, um, that's obviously logged into the system and a warning is sent off anytime that exceeds a certain amount. And so police official, you know, heads of police departments can use this system to keep tabs on where there might be problems. Lastly, uh, there was a lot higher, quaint, this is just the last thing I'm throwing that we heard from the interviews is that they just did a lot more training and better quality training. Uh, one of the things there is that one police, one or several of the police departments said that prior to this, they would just have anybody train their officers. Now CLIA requires that the, you have to document who was training your officers and they have to have some certification to say that they're qualified to train other officers before. Uh, it was just anybody could train anybody on anything. Uh, and that's one change that one of the police departments uh, said. The last couple here, uh, so obviously there are limitations to this. Um, anytime you have to enter in data that's self-reported, there's an opportunity for people to manipulate that data. Um, and there's evidence to say that, that that happens at times. And so that's a huge hurdle. Um, the second thing is that it may discourage other accountability measures. So police departments may say, hey, I'm accredited, you know, I don't need a civilian review board. I don't have any necessarily have any, any evidence that people actually say that, but people might try to say that. The other thing, and this is obvious, and I didn't put this on this, but hopefully it's obvious is that this is not going to eliminate systemic racism. And I think that's why Mimi's organization is so important because it takes a holistic approach. Um, and then last and perhaps most important thing is that I worked with some awesome collaborators, Rachel Boggs, Jennifer Lake, Sarah Rush, and Colin Merritt. Um, and so I will stop. Gordon, thank you so much for that. Uh, Mimi, I, I, I want to quickly get back to you and loop in some of the stuff that, that Gordon highlighted. And, and, and before we, we started this in the arena, we were talking and you said that the, the use of data in looking at policing is, is relatively new, that, that we are in uncharted territory. So I, I want you to talk us about that kind of wild west of uncharted territory, as well as where the resistance points have been. Is it with the actual police officers? Is it with the city or county leadership? Is it with community groups? How, how are folks who aren't maybe nerds such as us assimilating these data-driven points? Mm -hmm. Now that's a really good question. So um, I have to point to, so there's a couple of things there, right? So like this understanding of this of this new era of public safety is brand new, right? Like we're all kind of coming to this come to come to Jesus moment where we understand where you know white people are now becoming more empathetic to black to the black experience, um, and so this whole idea of like reimagining public safety is new. But with that said, evidence-based policing. It's also kind of new, but it's but it's something that I mean, back in 1998, um, you know, we call the father of evidence based policing. This is evidence based policing to give you a definition is the concept of evidence based um, 
is that like evidence-based policing is like policing should be based on scientific evidence about what works best, right? Like you wouldn't go to the hospital and allow a surgeon to do a surgery on you that has not been backed by evidence or done several times over to know that it works. Well, that's the same concept um, that EBP, evidence-based policing, applies to policing, right? And so measure also, we partner with the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing in a lot of our work to understand how policing has such a lack of EBP and data-driven tactics, um, even their training, right? Like we say, oh, we want uh, this type of um, implicit bias training, but do we know it really works, right? How, what's, where's the evidence? Um, what are the outcomes? Um, so in order to really suggest this idea of evidence-based policing, like it, 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 it means that we have to do two things. The first thing is that we need to increase the amount of research that's conducted in policing. That's number one. Personally, I don't rely on the ability um, and the resources at the several different police departments to do this right now on their own. I can tell you at Austin Police Department, gratefully, they have just brought on a new CDO, Chief Data Officer. Houston mm -hmm. um, Police Department has a CDO, Chief Data Officer, that her name is Dr. Poor. Um, and Measure has been a huge proponent in creating this office within the police department. But there's, to me, there's just so many, it's just so problematic right now at the police department, right? And so we can't even really rely on a lot of the data um, that's even collected. Some people are collecting, you know, uh, when they write a ticket, they're, they're saying that, you know, a person is one race over the other race because of the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, the, the lack of great records management systems that, that need to be um, implemented. So, so when I say that, you know, a lot of the recommendations that we have right now are really evidence informed, right? Like we can say, um, and we can kind of get into some of those evidence informed um, recommendations, but we can say, you know, that there are programs that can reduce cost um, and then have better outcomes. We don't know if they can reduce costs and have better outcomes in Austin police uh, or in Austin um, particularly because there really hasn't been any good re rigorous research done. But this is a call to the research community. This really is. It's a call to um, it's it's a call to the city to to prioritize um, evidence based policing, evidence based community policing, and the um, and the partnerships needed in order to really understand the system. Um, because I always say all the time, you know, this experiment really, you know, of policing is is freaking hurting people um, and and wasting a lot of money. And so that's, 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 that's when we kind of are trying to frame this idea of evidence informed and evidence based policing. Okay. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, so one, one thing I, I wanted to bring up for, for both of you, um, Gordon, I'll, I'll start with you. But um, this summer with the, the focus on policing, public safety, how do we fix this? There have been calls from some to defund the police department. So if, if you guys can walk us through kind of the, um, you know, kind of the policy aspects of that, and also your own personal opinion based on your research on your data of the viability of defunding police departments. Gordon, I'll, I'll start with you. Oh, I'll put goodness. you in the hot seat. Okay, no, I, I think the general idea that we need to spend a heck of a lot more money on prevention, stuff like mental health and uh, education and uh, a whole host of other things, I think makes total sense. Um, and I think additionally, we've seen some equipment, especially in large cities, cities like New York, cities uh, in Seattle and other places, where we've seen equipment that we don't think, or at least many think, uh, seem to think that police departments should not have. And so really revisiting uh, those, that equipment and also revisiting um, how much we're investing in mental health and how much we're investing in education, how much we're investing in getting people jobs uh, is all important. I think one thing I'll say is that from the interviews I had, uh, the police officers, some of these departments really do need 
more equipment. You know, there are a lot. And so I, I, when we say that, I think we need to sort of disaggregate and the problem with our inability to disaggregate is because we don't have great data. Um, and so it makes it a, a huge problem. But there are cities that probably could be defunded uh, and it improve public safety and other cities where they do probably do need more funding. So some of the police departments that I talk with in order to become accredited, they didn't have uh, bulletproof vests or they didn't have cameras in certain spots. And they were doing, they were interviewing um, persons that they uh, stopped and brought in or detained and they were doing them in the, in the absence of cameras. And so that department said that they needed to buy cameras in order to come in compliance with education. There are some police departments without body cameras. Body cameras aren't perfect, um, but they can be useful. Um, we, didn't have it, we don't have any body cameras in the killing of Breonna Taylor and that, that may have helped uh, either prevent that, uh, her killing or brought justice to her more swiftly. So I, I think you know, there are, I'm sure, places where uh, you know, we can defund police or take money away from police budgets. Um, I think we have to be careful about, um, we have to be, it's important to acknowledge the fact that technology can be extremely important for enhancing accountability. So let's say that we wanted to collect more data and hire a chief data officer, then we might require, you know, it might require more money for police budgets. So I think we need to both provide more support for prevention. Uh, we need to um, sort of stop police from, killing people unjustly, obviously. But we also need to provide other measures that also um, bolster that effort to enhance public safety and to enhance the safety for the officers as well. Uh, not, police officers not having bulletproof vests is not good for them, it's not good for anybody. So um, that's my two cents, but. Okay, a little bit more of a scalpel approach. Mimi. Yeah, so I, I'm never ever going to discount the fact that, you know, about officer health and, and wellness and keeping them safe, I mean, you know, I, um, my, my husband was a, was an officer in the Air Force, you know, and he would go out every single day and I would always want to make sure that he came home. Now, granted, he was at war as an officer too, so that was a scary thing. So I totally understand that, but I also totally 100% believe that, um, that and, and the data and so in the data like we did some analysis that measure and we found that lower police spending does not lead to increased violent outcomes mm -hmm. to violent crime mm -hmm. like it just doesn't and um, a common concern is that you know when you are reducing police funding is that it's going to have an impact on violent crime like crime is going to go up right and so that's just not true um at least the data does not support that concern and so i have to i have to think about i have to think about that when 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 understanding that question and i also have to think about the fact that you know there are so many police officers out there that if you ask them if they could you know if someone else could intervene or if a professional you know somebody that has the a, a, a mental health background can step in um they would probably say yes like there's several yeah. of them out there that understand the limitations that they um that in their ability to police people that are you know in special populations right or that that may think differently um and so when we talk about defunding the police we're not saying we don't want police right we don't want to say we don't we're not saying that we're saying um you know that's to me would be you know a, a super idealistic state of of the world where we can just completely abolish and there's no problems right and we can totally take care of ourselves and we have no issues or more violent crime but we are saying that there are just like how you said that scalpel approach there are definitely systems out there that work better than police. We know that. We know that 100%. We know that this, you know, the police budget is so incredibly, in, you know, large versus the, the real efficiency and what we're getting out of the system. We know that if we bring in groups like, like, um, like integral care, which now they're within the police department, they're doing 911 calls, and different things like that, we get better outcomes. Um, we get better diversion. And so that's what we're saying. We're saying boost up what, what um, public safety really is, provide that funding so that those organizations can do the work, um, take away that funding from what doesn't work. For example, 
there's a there's an amazing organization here in Austin, and if you don't know them, you should. They're called Ten Thousand Fearless. These are a group of you know black people that are mostly out in East Austin that get phone calls every single day to respond to public safety issues. And they're and they you know they are trained. They are ready to go. Um, they understand their community. They're from their community. They 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 protect them because they are them. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and it's these organizations that we, you know, we need to be able to fund to be fully sustainable um, that actually have really great outcomes um, and that can keep our community safe. So I'm, I'm gonna start pulling some questions from the Q&A because we have a whole bunch. Uh, <laughs> so, so let me kind of condense two of them which is we have Marina and where was the other question here? Um, Dave, I believe, you know, pulling out their hair saying in our sectors, I think Marina's in health and Dave is in business. We have accreditation. You have to have accreditation, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the customers require it. This is what we need. Why, why not with police departments? Why aren't more police departments getting accredited? Why are governments, local governments, state governments, not holding police accountable to accreditation? I, I don't know if you could kind of pull the curtain back, Gordon, and, and give us a sense of the why not, since we see it in other sectors. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think police unions are a huge obstacle mm -hmm. towards public safety in general and towards police departments not becoming so insular. Um, and so, I really think it's police, uh, police unions. It does cost money, as I said before, and for some of the, you know, most police departments that are accredited are mid to small size uh, organizations. Um, and in part, if you want to accredit a large police department, which I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, I, I think it can be done and should probably be done, um, you would have to hire additional staff and that cost, uh, you know, cost money um, because the volume of records that you have to keep up uh, increases. But I think more so it's just that uh, at least I, I talked with one uh, chief and he said, you know, it's kind of like a wild, the wild, wild west out here in terms of policing because each police department sort of does its own thing. And that's not to say that overall police officers, you know, there are a lot of good police officers and we shouldn't, I don't know if we should keep having to say that because everyone knows that that is true. Um, but the standards are not, they vary greatly across and they're just mm -hmm. not terribly willing to, and willing to uh, open themselves up to scrutiny. But it also, uh, and I think Mimi made a good point, there's also a history behind this, right? And so, you know, we haven't got away from that history and, you know, history is, it tends to repeat itself. And so um, racism has to do with it. Um, and also just police unions and these police uh, union, the heads of police unions that say openly racist, not just racist, but extremely insensitive things uh, publicly and nothing happens to them. And so I guess the last thing I'll say is like, for me, the key is in dealing with police unions because police unions mm -hmm. um, are a huge obstacle, but. Okay. Um... And, and, and with this idea of, you know, having the data, having the accountability, Mimi, I want to come back to one thing you said about um, CDOs, chief data officers. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the trend? Is this totally new? Has this been growing? Where are you seeing the CDO trend in police department scale? I mean, I can, I would probably be safe to say that it's, it's pretty new. Right. Um, I think it's coming out of the evidence-based policing movement. Right. I mean, we've studied criminology for forever, um, policing forever, but really the applying the data to inform tactics, procedure, policy, that's something new. And doing it in a way that is digestible to police to understand is something that is new and that's coming with this EBP movement. Um, again, the first CDO that I have ever met was Dr. Poor from Houston Police Department. Um, Measure had, we've, we've put on five national conferences at this point. Um, 
called big data and I'm now calling it public safety, big data and public safety. Um, and we, sh we, we bring, we brought Dr. Poor along with us as one of the trainers for this conference um, where she could share her office and how she structured her office and where it came from. And so again, that, you know, this, this idea of bringing on a CDO, having more of an academic within the police department to understand the, you know, data statistics and so forth is incredibly important, but don't limit it to just academics, right? I mean, there are just within measure, we have police officers that work directly with us that have never even gone to college, right? Um, that help to advise and inform and just provide their perspective as we provide our perspective. So we respect that. Um, and so it's, you know, data is for everyone. It, it should be. Um, and so this, again, this idea of the CDO, it's pretty new. Austin, it's obviously new to Austin because we literally just hired our first, right? Um, but it definitely needs to be, it definitely needs to become a thing. We have with us uh, David Carter, um, who is the chief of UTPD Austin, University of Texas Police Department. And he says, thank you for your interesting presentation as chief of UTPD Austin. Um, that is currently undergoing reaccreditation. I don't see accreditation as the objective, but the baseline where the department starts to identify issues and new approaches. Question to Gordon and, and Mimi. What are your thoughts that we have 18,000 decentralized police organizations with their own organizational cultures? What are your thoughts on centralizing some police services? This is a big one, David. That that's that's a whole lot to unpack. Um, Gordon, maybe I'll, I'll go to you first. Just initial thoughts of of where to start the conversation on maybe some central core aspects. Yes, and one thing I'll say is uh, the assistant chief of police at UTPD. He's always nice, Chief Sheets. He has come to my class two times and has always answered students' questions and they've grilled him a little bit. And so I just want to give a shout out to to them. Uh, and Mimi's also come to my class, so I'm thankful to her. But um, <laughs> as far as uh, police consolidation, I, I think, I guess I don't have, this is initial thoughts, but I think one of the positive uh, aspects of localizing any government resource is that um, the, the service is closer to the people and the people can have, one. The, the theory is that people can have more say over that particular service, right? So whether if something's centralized, maybe uh, it's more difficult. And I'm not saying this is always the case. I'm just sort of ribbing off this, but it might be farther from where people live. And so they might have to drive further or the people who are in that government agency might not represent the same background or values of the people in that uh, consolidated, consolidated agency. And so I, I think, you know, just thinking about off of the theories about consolidation, one of the issues is that um, there's a chance that the people working in that consolidated agency are not representative of all of the communities that are being served by that agency. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think we can find resources if we want to do policing better. Um, so I don't think consolidation has to be uh, the number one option, but that's just some thoughts off the top of my head. Yeah, I honestly have not ever thought about consolidation. That's the first time that I've ever <laughs> been posed that question. Um, I do believe that there are some national best practices that all police departments should implement. I mean, during, you know, the, um, and I'm going to say the wonderful Obama years, we had um, the 21st century policing task force that provided several recommendations that I believe that um, all police departments should be looking at. Measure continues to have this conversation during our conference, you know, when we, when we have our conference every year um, about why it's so important to really understand those, those several different pillars and apply them to every single police department in some type of way. I mean, I do believe that each city and, you know, jurisdiction is different, 
but there are best practices that have been identified that can be more, um, that can be applied. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, I, I do want to get um, to one question that was asked early on, and, and this is to you, Mimi, from uh, Marina again, which is, can you speak to how the widespread, widespread um, um, armament of citizens in the U.S. and cultural enthusiasm for the Second Amendment poses a challenge to public safety and the movement reimagining a peaceful society, given our, our, our larger constitutional framework? Okay, so you guys are bringing me back to school. That's what it's, 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 <laughs> so we're talking about the Second Amendment, um, yes. what the right to bear arms, right? right to so, bear arms, yeah. Okay, so, you know, oh, I am so in conflict right, right that, with that because, see, I'm coming and I'm going to put on my hat as a sister of several Black brothers who deal with schizophrenia as a mom of black sons, one of which is six feet tall, has tattoos everywhere, is a football player at San Diego State, you know, um, would I ever want to see him walking down the street with a gun, right? Um, I think that, I think that um, there is a difference when it comes to a black man's ability to exercise his right to the Second Amendment. We saw this with Philando Castile. You see what I'm saying? Just by having the acknowledgement that the black man or even the black woman or whoever it may be has a gun. We just saw this, you know, it, it, you know, so the fear I think that is America right now doesn't allow the same, doesn't allow the same rights. With that said, I am against, you know, the mass gun, you know, use and, and so forth. I just, I personally am. I believe that there needs to be, um, you know, more, um, more laws, more rules against gun use, against gun ownership. I mean, just period. And I, and I understand, like, even now, for Black people in my own community, the, you know, this idea of becoming armed, protecting oneself, it's not new, right? Like my dad was a Black Panther, right? My uncle was a Black Panther. They all believed in this idea. But I also have, and this is again, just me personally, I also have this grand fear that, um, that, it, that it's not, it just doesn't turn out well, right? So like even you'll have a Black man who will have a gun, uh, to protect people around him, just like we saw back in 2018, um, you know, during a, a crim during criminal activity, and he was shot by a cop, thinking that he was the bad guy, while he's protecting his, you know, protecting people. And so I think that there has to be there has to be a very deep conversation about the Second Amendment. There has to be better 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 rules. We just saw what just happened downtown. Um, this Saturday, right? Um, rest in peace. And I just, and so that, you know, when things like that happen, it's heart wrenching um, to, to, to understand. And I, honestly, I mean, if you compare America with other places, I mean, why, right? Like, why are we walking around with, with, um, with, with AK militaristic type, like weaponry? You know, I mean, I, I just, I just personally don't understand it. And I don't think that it is conducive to a more peaceful society. So that's just, that's, that's my thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Um, let me get to Tom Howarth's question. Uh, I know we are starting to run up against the hour, but Tom says, if only a small percentage of police departments meet the CLIA standards, would it be wise for governors and mayors to require their departments to get accredited? In other words, do you convert what are good suggestions into requirements? And before you answer that question, I want to read a, um, a request, a statement that was sent by a registrant, just putting it on the radar that the Texas Peace Officer Licensee Agency, the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, is up for sunset review this legislative cycle. Um, it would be great if you, the panelists, could provide recommendations for improving the agency. The state is currently undergoing this once every 12 year reform process. So perhaps this is this, this one opportunity where we can get 
these recommendations out there. So Gordon, let me start with you and, and come back to you, Mimi, to address these points. Yeah, so I think one of the things I, I study police officers and public school teachers in public schools. And the thing I like about those two areas is that we all have a say, we all interact with police departments, we all interact with public schools, and everyone should have a right to uh, register their comments or register their opinion. Um, and so I think part of my answer here is, I, if police departments are not going to be accredited, you know, what should, they should say what they're going to do. But I also want to say that um, I sort of conveyed some of the research I had, but I think everyone has a right to say what um, they think police departments should do differently. And I don't take my own uh, opinion as sort of gospel about what people should do. Um, I, I think we all should be engaged in this process, not only about deciding whether uh, police departments should be accredited or not, but also to your point about the certification for police officers. I think um, it's great that you brought up that point because everyone should be able to comment on that. And when not everyone comments on it, you know, police unions tend to gain sway and they do things that are not always in the interest of public safety. And I think the really overarching point I wanna make is that police unions don't help police officers. And that's the thing I think we need to convey better is that it puts them more at risk because they are perpetuating um, problems that people clearly see. And so I guess I'm sort of sidestepping that question in part because like Mimi's work does, we all interact with public safety and we all need to register our opinions about what we're seeing. And so, I don't know if that answers it, but I really want to but, convey this idea that we all, everyone should, you know, don't take my opinion as gospel. I think I was persuaded by a policing accreditation research, but um, anyway. Well, we will have the opportunity as the Sunset Commission meets, so Gordon, I hope to see you at the Capitol, uh, as well as you, Mimi. Um, last word to you. Yeah, so first of all, who, whoever that was that recommended that we kind of get together to put some recommendations together for t contact me. Um, <laughs> hello at wemeasure.org. I would love to do that. I get to sit on the board locally for the APD, for APD's t commission um, and would love to do that. I think that is incredibly important and whoever said that is obviously in the know. So <laughs> definitely want to connect with that person. Um, yeah. Accreditation needs to happen across the board to me. I think it's incredibly important. <laughs> um, I'm all about, you know, doing things in ways that make sense, that are continually um, scrutinized to just be better for everyone. Um, and again, I, I believe that, um, Gordon, your work is fantastic. I can't, you know, I just can't wait to engage more. Um, but I just, you know, as a last word, at the end of the day, even with everything that we're saying today, with accreditation, with, and with evidence-informed decisions, with doing things differently, with reimagining public safety, we have got to get down to the roots of institutional racism. And if we cannot dismantle, disrupt, um, and defund, <laughs> institutional racism that we're really not going to get anywhere and so I'm I'm incredibly inspired by every by, by all of these conversations that we're having because I've said it before and I'll say it again it shines a laser beam light on how progressive we really are in Austin you know all of this talk that we've said and said you know all these years prior you you lay a you know civil unrest um, a civil right, a new civil rights movement with a pandemic, right? You understand the illness and the virus of institutionalized racism. And so I'm really hoping that we all wake up, right? And that we all walk differently. We move differently. We think differently. We, we reimagine even differently because we've been talking about reimagining for years. So it's time to, it's time for us to wake up. Um, and to do things differently. And I'm, and I'm encouraged at what's happening in order for that to all come together. Well, I am encouraged by the work of both of you, uh, by folks who have joined us today who are incredibly engaged. I'm sorry for not getting to all of the questions, but please reach out to us at the LBJ School, to Dr. Gordon Abner, to Mimi. Before I let you all go though, I, I wanna let you know about our next in the, in the arena, 
two weeks from today, we are going to be looking at women in color in the political arena. We know that in just a couple of days, we will be hearing who the, the vice presidential pick for President, Vice President Biden is. Um, so I think that's gonna be very interesting to unpack whether that is a woman of color or not, descriptive representation, substantive representation. Uh, and this is a co-hosted program. I'm very, very excited about this with the inaugural LBJ Women's Campaign School. So I will be joined by Ishante Golar, the founder of the podcast, The Brown Girl's Guide to Politics and president of Emerge America and Janelle King, co-founder of Speak Georgia and panelist of the TV show, Georgia Gang. So I hope to see you all back here. We will have this in the arena with Dr. Abner and Mrs. Stiles up um, in just a couple of days. So look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.